You know, we've spent the uh, last week or so in our daily Bible reading, reading about the life of Abraham. And we've read about Abraham's faith and Abraham's faith and how it was challenged throughout his life. Abraham's story there, as we've been reading, picks up there in about Genesis chapter 12, where God calls him to leave his family and his home and go to a land where God will show him. And Abraham goes. And there in Genesis chapter 15 and 17, Abraham, who by this point in his life is a pretty old man, says, it finds out from God that he's going to have a son, and Abraham believes God. And there in Genesis chapter 22, which is one of the more difficult passages for any parent in all of Scripture, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to go sacrifice your son on the altar as a burnt offering before me. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes for a second. If you're a parent, you know some of the thoughts that may have been running through Abraham's mind at this time. God has just told you to go sacrifice your one and your only son, that son that you love, that son that you care about. How are you responding? I can just be honest for a second. I'm not sure I'm rushing to pack my bags. That would be a hard command for me to obey. But Abraham does. You see, when you look at Abraham's life, one of the things I notice about his life is that when his faith is tested, his faith grows stronger. I think that's what we see there in Genesis chapter 22, when he is told to go sacrifice his son. And for some of us, this story there in Genesis chapter 22 may be a familiar story. And for some of us, perhaps this story is maybe not so familiar. But regardless of where we are on that spectrum, I want to look at this text with some fresh eyes and maybe look at it from a, maybe a different perspective than we've ever looked at this text before. I want us to look at Christ in the story of Isaac. This story ultimately here in Genesis 22 is about a father's faith. It's about a son's faith and their faith in God's plan. But this story also gives us a glimpse I believe, into God's greater plan. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible, all 66 books in our English Bible, tell one single story. And that's the story of salvation. And you see a little hint of that story of salvation there in the sacrifice of Isaac there in Genesis chapter 22. I think this story illustrates how throughout all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God is giving us clues and God is giving us hints to God's greater plan. That plan that God had from before the foundation of the world to give his one and only son so that anyone who believed on him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so today, I want to focus on six parallels. Six parallels between the sacrifice of Isaac and the sacrifice of Christ that I hope will give us a better appreciation for this story, a better understanding of this story and how it fits into the whole story of Scripture. But I also hope it will build our faith and give us greater confidence and trust in God's plan for not only our life, but God's plan for us and our faith. And strengthen our faith so when our faith is tempted, we will stand firm just like Abraham. When we look at Abraham's life, that's one of the things that he's known for, is that tremendous faith. Hebrews 11 spends a lot of time talking about the faith of Abraham. Probably more than any other patriarch, Hebrews 11 highlights Abraham's tremendous faith. Even in those moments when having faith was difficult. And we read about that moment there in Genesis chapter 22, where God says these words. Abraham, beginning in chapter, verse 1. Here I am, Abraham answers. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. 
So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to a place God told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand he took the fire and the knife, and, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide. The lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed the, him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Just think about that verse for a second. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. There's a lot to unpack in those 14 verses, but just to kind of catch us up, by this point in Abraham's life, God has blessed Abraham with almost every conceivable physical blessing. He's rich He's powerful, he's influential, he's got that son that he's finally been promised. And if we're a parent, when we get this command, as we thought about a moment ago, we're sitting there going, I love my son, I care for my son, I adore my son. Now in Genesis chapter 22, God tells me I need to go kill my son? Like, what's going on here? Abraham's world there in Genesis 22 comes crashing down because God is asking him to kill his one and only son. That son of promise, that son of blessing, that son that he had looked forward to for so long, the son that brought so much joy into his life is going to die. At Abraham's hands. Again, put yourself in Abraham's shoes for a second. You've been waiting for that son, and now you're called to sacrifice him. And, and if we're Abraham here in Genesis 22, we're probably going, what in the world is going on here? We're probably a little confused. Sacrifice the son of promise? I, I, I'm missing the greater picture, God. What do you want? What are you doing? But Genesis 22, verse 1, tells us something that's so important for us to remember. That God is testing Abraham. Does Abraham really trust God? Does he love God more than that child of promise? Will Abraham obey God in everything? You know, if we were in Abraham's shoes, some of us may have been tempted to question God and ask or say something like, that's just too cruel. Why would you ask me to do that? Why would you ask me to kill my son? I'm supposed to die, not my son. But Abraham doesn't. And that's where we see the first parallel between the story of Christ and the story of Isaac. That in both cases, the only beloved son is sacrificed. Now, I don't know about you, but my mind goes to John chapter 3 and verse 16. 
for God so loved the world? That's the other translation, but we'll go with my translation I have on the screen. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son. Notice the similarity in the highlighted text of what we read there in Genesis 22. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You see, God is not asking Abraham to do something he himself is not willing to do. God asked Abraham to give your one and only son. God actually gave his one and only son. That's how far God was willing to go for us. But that's just the first parallel. The second parallel is also found there in the second verse where God tells Abraham to go to Mount Moriah. Now, I know there are some geography wizards here, and we all love to hear about geography in the Bible. We all get excited when that word comes up. Or maybe we're in the other camp and we're going, why? Like, how does geography tie into the story of Christ? What's going on here? This is not some random mountain that Abraham is told to go to. Mount Moriah was a mountain in Jerusalem. In fact, later in Israelite history, the temple would be built on Mount Moriah. The temple was the place where Israelites went to offer sacrifices year after year after year. But Mount Moriah, the temple, isn't just the place where Israelites went to go offer sacrifices year after year. Some 2,000 years after Abraham receives this command, another son of promise, another son of Abraham, walks through and around the mountains of Moriah, the city of Jerusalem with wood on his back. Wood in the form of a cross. As Jesus, the Son of God, went to his death, went to his sacrificial death. Most of Jesus' final hours, as we read about him in the Gospels, in our back classrooms, were spent on Mount Moriah or in the nearby vicinity. The text also tells us there in the in Genesis chapter 22, that Abraham is told to go offer Isaac as a burnt offering. And by this point in the, the Genesis account, the people of God have been offering burnt offerings for a pretty long time. You see guys like Noah offer burnt offerings, guys like Job offering burnt offerings. And now Isaac is told, or Abraham is told to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. And I think it's really easy for us to read back past this because some of those Old Testament sacrifices seem so distant to us. I mean, who hasn't observed the Passover when it comes to the book of Leviticus and their daily Bible reading? It's okay to shake your head there. Leviticus seems really distant and really hard for us. Because we don't understand that. We don't live in a world where we're killing cows and lambs for sacrifices. Or maybe we're in the other camp where we're sitting here going, I am so glad I didn't have to bring a lamb. I don't have to kill a cow. I don't have to kill a goat because I can't stand blood and guts. And if that's the camp you're in, I'm right there with you. Because I don't do blood and guts. And so that Old Testament sacrificial system would have been hard for me. But in the Old Testament, one of the things that sacrificial system is trying to teach the people of God is the cost of sin. Those sacrifices were the way that someone made atonement for sin. And so if you wanted to atone for sin, if you wanted to have your sins forgiven, you needed to offer that perfect lamb, Leviticus 1 chapter says. But when we move to the New Testament particularly there in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. We see Jesus described as the perfect lamb. And, and that's really where we see the third parallel. That we see the parallel of a sacrifice, a sacrifice specifically of a pure lamb, a perfect lamb. And if we were to read the Hebrews chapter 10 tonight, 
and read particularly the first 10 verses. It really describes how Christ, all those Old Testament sacrifices, anticipated or looked forward to the final sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. And that was the sacrifice of Christ. That Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. And so far with just the first two verses, we've already seen three parallels. That Abraham is told to give his only son on the mountain of Moriah to atone for sin. But there are three more to go. You see, Abraham was given that impossible command there in the text. And to be honest, he probably didn't fully understand the why there in Genesis chapter 22. He didn't understand why God wants him to go kill his only son. But guess what we see there in the text? The text tells us in verse 3, early the next morning. Abraham doesn't dilly-dally. He doesn't wait. He doesn't go, well, next month is a little more convenient for me. The next morning, he packs his bags, and he grabs his sons, and he grabs his servants, and he grabs his donkey, and he grabs Isaac, and begins that long journey to Moriah. He didn't understand the why, but he still obeyed. And Abraham's faith here in Genesis 22 teaches us a powerful lesson about what faith really is. And what it should look like in our life. See, Abraham's example shows us sometimes understanding can wait. But obedience cannot. There in the text, Abraham may not have fully obeyed, fully understood, but he immediately obeyed. And that's how Abraham has such a strong example for us today. And there in verse 4, it says that on the third day, they could see the mountain off in the distance. And that should trigger some some things in our mind as, as New Testament Christians. Because just as Isaac and Abraham arrived near the mountains of Moriah on the third day, Jesus, the Son of God, returned to the mountains of Moriah on the third day day as the resurrected Lord. That's the fourth parallel I see there in the text. And the story goes on. They arrive there in the mountains and Abraham turns and says, the boy and I are going to go a little bit farther. Note that. The boy and I. Abraham knows what God told him to do. Abraham knows what a burnt offering is. Abraham knows how this story is supposed to end. And yet Abraham's response says, The boy and I will return. How could Abraham say that? How could Abraham say the boy and I are going to return when Abraham knows he's about to kill his son? Well, Hebrews 11 verse 19 fills us in on one detail that the book of Genesis does not. That he, that's Abraham, considered God to be even able to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. Abraham believed that God would raise his son from the dead. That's faith. Abraham had faith to go to the mountain. Abraham had faith to bring his son. Abraham had faith to bring the wood. He had faith to say, the boy and I will come back. Abraham believes in God no matter the cost. And as they're making the final trip, the final steps up to the mountains of Moriah, there in verse 7, Isaac looks to his father and says, Dad, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt? offering. Now, I think this tells us something about Abraham's faith. That Abraham's faith wasn't just something he talked about. It wasn't something that was just personal to him. It was something he lived in the home. That it was something he taught his kids about. Because there in the text, 
Isaac, his son, knows enough about burnt offerings to know that a burnt offering usually involves a lamb. I can't help but wonder, what are we teaching our kids at home? What are we teaching our kids about faith and worshiping God? Are we teaching what they need to know to build up a faith, a faith much like Isaac has in the text? But I can't help but highlight Abraham's response in verse 8. That God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Again, Abraham knows what he's told to do. He knows where he's going. He knows why he's going there. But Abraham still trusts that God will provide. That's faith in impossible circumstances. And when they finally arrive there on the mountain, Abraham builds the altar. He ties up his son. He places his son on the altar. And mind you, Isaac knows how altar uh, sacrifices happen. He's seen this happen before. He knows that you bind the lamb. He knows that you put the lamb on the altar, not your son. He knows where this is going. But there in Genesis 22, there's absolutely no indication that Isaac resisted. And that leads us to our fifth parallel. That both Isaac and Jesus were both bound. They were bound by their kinfolk. Now Abraham is ready. His son's on the altar. His son is bound up. The fire is ready. He raises the knife. And then the angel of the Lord speaks up. And says, Abraham, now I know you believe me. I've tested you. Your faith is true. And off in the distance, there's a lamb. How God provided the perfect lamb for the sacrifice. Isaac's execution, Isaac's sacrifice was commanded by God. Isaac was on the altar. He was ready to die. He needed something to redeem him from that certain death. He needed the lamb that God could only provide. And that's exactly what God did. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, God has continually put in this in our minds of the idea of someone dying in place of another to atone from sin for sin. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we're there in the garden where Adam and Eve have committed that first sin. And and they come out with the garments of fig leaves and God says that's not good enough. And what does God do there in the garden? But he makes garments of animal skin. Where do you suppose that animal skin came from? A sacrifice. That an animal had to die to cover the sin and cover the shame of Adam and Eve's sin there in the garden. And we see that lamb dying there in Genesis chapter 22 in place of Isaac. And all of this is looking forward to the great moment in all of history, the centerpiece in all of history, when Christ, the very Son of God, the Lamb of God, died in our place for our sin. We needed that lamb. Because our execution papers have been signed. And we deserve death because we all have sinned. And we all need that lamb to die in our place. And yet once again, God provided that sacrifice. Jesus knew why he was going to come. And yet he came anyways. So much so at the very beginning of his ministry in John chapter 1 and verse 29, John sees Jesus coming toward him and he cries out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, all these parallels 
that we see in the story of Isaac and the sacrifice of Christ are designed to teach us something. They're designed to strengthen our faith. They're designed to go back and help us understand the story of God. And so when we see these parallels there in the text, I really hope that our response is not, oh, well, that's pretty cool. I've never seen that before. That's a good response to have. I hope maybe you've seen something new tonight. But I hope that's not our primary response. I hope the response that we have when we see these parallels is faith that God has had a plan from the very beginning. And all throughout Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all the way to Revelation, God is working his plan together and he is giving us sneak peeks and he's giving us clues and he's giving us hints and he's giving us all these things and all these Old Testament sacrifices and all these stories that we read about to tell us a little more about that plan that God had from the foundation of the word world. But I also hope this increases our faith in God, particularly in God's word, that as we see the Bible tell one story and we see all these parallels, that we realize that the Bible that we hold in our hand that was written by 40 different people over 1,500 years was not an accident that it was the work of a divine author. It was a work of God inspiring the human authors to record specific details and specific stories for our benefit so we can read these stories and come to a greater faith and a greater understanding of our God and his will and his uh, desire for us. But I hope more than anything that we see and we realize that We need to have faith that Jesus is that perfect Lamb of God who did die for our sins. And it's by faith in Jesus today that we are still saved. Nothing but the blood of Jesus is going to save us. And so where is our faith today? God has made us some promises. If you're a child of God, God has made some promises to you. That God has promised you salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. He has promised you a home in heaven with him for all eternity. He has promised that you'll be raised from the dead. Do you believe God will be faithful to his promises? God was faithful to his promises to Abraham. Do you believe that God will be faithful to his promises to you? If you do, are you living like it? Is it affecting your life today? Maybe you're here and you haven't been living by faith and you're ready to make a change. You're ready to start living by faith for him for all eternity. If we can help you with that, please let us know while together we stand and sing.